Good afternoon and welcome to Shop Talk Live. Joining us this afternoon is Brian Donaldson, CEO of the Maxall Group, Craig Philipson, Managing Director of Shopworks, and Joe Boner, Principal and Founder of Boner Design Lab. Dan, over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, we have this global conversation every Friday or most Fridays at 2 p.m. UK time. And um, as usual, I'd like to give a, a big welcome to our international audience. We have 165 uh, colleagues uh, participating today from 27 countries. Um, so very warm welcome to you all. Um, we've sent you uh, the virtual tour pre-watch. Um, so you've seen, uh, hopefully, all of... Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Dan. You've hopefully seen, many of you will have seen uh, a lot of the Clare Castle store and also heard something of, of, of Brian uh, when he was interviewed in the store uh, ahead of the, the, the webinar today. Um, so I'm going to be talking some more with Brian uh, for another 15 minutes or so in a minute, um, till up, up till 2.15 UK time. And then after that, we're going to have a very exciting presentation from Craig Philipson from Shopworks and Joe Boner at Boner Design Lab, really looking at their future vision uh, for forecourts and what that looks like. Um, that'll take us up to about 2.35 p.m., at which point um, we'll welcome Brian back on and then we'll all have a chat about it and uh, hopefully take some questions, which, uh, which audience, the audience hopefully will have, will have posted on the Q&A button uh, while we're going. Um, so we'll take those questions for 10 minutes and finish up at 2.45. So um, there we have it. Um, <clears throat> it's been a very interesting um, few days looking at what you've been doing with, with in the Clare Castle store, Brian. First of all, congratulations on it. Thank you. And um, can you talk through, let's just get straight into some of the detail um, because we're all quite familiar with the store, although we obviously haven't had the chance to visit it yet, many of us. But um, Talk about, let's talk about this, the decision you took to bring the Maxwell brand um, into the shop. Okay, Dan, well, look, first, you know, thanks very much indeed for the opportunity to talk about Clare Castle. And, and the first thing is, look, it's been a massive team effort really within our business. Uh, as to the reason why we did it, well, look, uh, we've always been into convenience retailing and, and up until 2016, 2017, we partnered under the Mace brand uh, with our strategic partners, BWG Foods in, you know, in the south of Ireland. Our view was, look, the next transition was to create our own Maxwell store. And uh, we went out, we did a lot of market research, and the confidence that we got from, from those customers that we interviewed was, look, this is the next natural step that we should do in terms of growing our convenience business. And the way we would describe it is almost taking Maxwell, which is 100 years old this year. You know, this is a, a special centenary for us. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has maybe put a little bit of a damper on that for us. But it was to extend the Maxwell brand, which traditionally has been known really as a fuel, fuel quality brand, uh, and to extend that in store. And we describe it in in our business is saying, we want not only to put product in your, in, in your fuel tank, we also want to take it into your home and take it into your fridge. And, and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to create our own brand and something that certainly after many years and working very closely with BWG Foods was, was a very much natural move for us. Have you seen, I mean, before we get, we get into the side of the store and think about how it looks, which I think, and I think it looks great, but how, how's, how's that impacted on, um, on some of the, the numbers, uh, for shop numbers, Brian, as, as you've done that. I mean, obviously, Clare Castle's difficult to, to, to talk much about because it only opened just before the pandemic began, didn't it? But, but, but um, what's any, any numbers on, on, um, on the impact of that decision? <clears throat> I think, look, it's a good question. Look, all of us within this business are, are, are looking at how we reposition the offer. Uh, you know, we know that fuel is always going to be coming under more and more pressure, particularly as vehicles become more fuel efficient. We know where the green uh, agenda is going right across the world in terms of, of, of pressure to move to lower emission vehicles. So really, one of the things that we wanted to do was to grow our non-fuel income. And I have to say, last year when we rolled out Project Shop, which really was the heading uh, you know, for moving uh, from, from a symbol brand into our own, we have seen very strong lift right across our state, both in terms of core convenience, 
especially within our food service element under Maxwell Daily, and of course our own Rosa Coffee brand, and again, along with some of the other food franchises and other concepts that we've created ourselves. So it's been absolutely fundamental, fundamental business to make sure that we take more income, more profit, not only for ourselves, but for our independent retailers, and to lessen the dependency and the importance of income from fuel, which still remains important, but we've got to try to reduce our dependency on that income from fuel. Now, looking at the Clare Castle store again, um, it's a very attractive deli design. Um, I think you really get that um, from some of the photographs that we've seen. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it, look, it looks very effective, doesn't it? Were you happy with that, Brian? Indeed. Look, the whole thing here was to create a look and feel which gave people confidence. Uh, we wanted it to be quite modern, quite contemporary. The colours that we've used are very earthy. And, and, and that's where the market is at this moment in time. Uh, you know, from our point of view, the product itself sells. That's why we wanted to give the product the room to do the selling. And, and, and that's why we've invested very heavily in the right equipment. We've developed and, and, and let's say created the range for morning, for lunch and for evening. We've tried to create the confidence in terms of the professionalism on the training, you know, the back of house work that goes into all of this. And I think it's equally important to recognize the independent retailers that we've worked with in, in, in developing these concepts. You know, partners like Aramark, some of our key independent retailers that we've worked with over the years. This really has been a collective and a collaborative approach. And, you know, we are a family owned business. We're extremely proud of that. And I think that just shows the kind of values and the kind of culture within our business. Uh, you know, we've done this together. Yeah. yeah. Um... I suppose the, th the thing at the back of my mind, looking at what you've done uh, with this store and some of the other moves you've made is, is, is your position, is, is the sort of increased significance of own brands in, the, um, in your strategy, Brian. And we can perhaps look a bit more broadly at that in a minute about, you, you know, the whole brand. But, but, I mean, there are more own brands in this store, aren't there? I mean, I guess that you mentioned Rosa Coffee. That's one of your brands. You've decided to develop that yourself. I mean, can you explain some of the rationale for that decision? Yeah, again, we want something that's going to be unique to Maxwell. And Rosa Coffee is, is our own brand. It's trademarked. Uh, the hummingbird is all about the sensation that you get from coffee. It's all about giving you that instant energy. And the look and feel that we've created, again, using the greys and, and the nice tone of language really has created a very strong brand in a very quick period of time. Like Rosa Coffee uh, is now selling well over 5 million cups of coffee a year. And... And that only was introduced towards the end of 2018. So it's been a phenomenal success for us. I remember seeing it appear in, in, in many of your sites and, I, and you told me straight away that you were really pleased with, uh, with how it's going. So, I mean, it, it shows, you know, that, that you can, um, but where, where's the sort of, because obviously I know you work with brands as well, Brian. So, I mean, where's the, you know, where's the dichotomy, uh, where is the cutoff in terms of the decision to, to go with a, a brand or, or to develop your own? I mean, where, where are our max along that? question i think the first thing is we've never been scared to trial or to make an investment and without trialing and investing you'll never get the the you know, the learnings and the insights certainly some of the concepts that we partnered with which were sort of local indigenous irish food brands what we have found is that some of those have been successful and others haven't um, and really in looking forward our view is that we would like to create more of our own sort of specific types of food concepts. Mexico is a concept in terms of burritos, in terms of more spicy type products. We're also about to launch our new chicken offer, which is called the rotisserie, which is full chickens, it's hot chicken, it's how we turn that into a sandwich, how we turn that into a proper meal for people. Again, we like to own and control and to be able to be in charge of the destiny. I think for us, what we're looking at, Dan, is over the last three years, we've learned a considerable amount by actually getting in, rolling up our sleeves and learning firsthand what works what, what, and what doesn't work. Even this year, I'm, I'm delighted to say that we'll be opening our first three Burger Kings within our network in partnership with OKR Group. And that is something we are looking forward to, to see how that complements the Maxwell Deli, the Rosa Coffee or Mexico or our rotisserie chicken offer. And for us, what we now have learned, unless you can get a big global food franchise brand 
it's going to be a challenge to make it work from the numbers point of view. Like, I don't think anyone should forget we're in this to make money. It's about getting a return on our investment and it's making sure that we continue to remain relevant and attractive to our customers. Sounds, I mean, it makes a lot of sense in a way where you're positioned. It's a, it's a hybrid strategy, isn't it? Between if you like the, the strategy of an EG group, which is all about uh, brands um, and not much own brand really. Um, and then looking at while, while, where it isn't uh, about anything apart from, well, you know, for a lot of the store anyway, apart from the while, while brand and certainly in, in food service offers, you know, it's all going to be a while, while brand, but you know, for Maxwell, like it makes, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It does. And I think, look, the numbers speak for themselves, Dan. Look, we're very, very pleased in terms of how Project Shop has really sort of grown in terms of turnover across all of our key categories. And look, you know, when your retailers are positive that it's working uh, and it's working for them and it's working for us in terms of the main company. So, so look, I think we've learned an awful lot in a very short period of time over the last four to five years. And, and as I say, some things work, some things don't work. And, and as soon as you find them not working, it's time to close it and move on and take those learnings and try to, to, to put something in that's going to be uh, of value and of interest for each location that we have. Very, very good. And one of the things that I really picked up from the interview, the, the video interview that uh, hopefully many in the audience will have, will have watched, was what you had to say about uh, sustainability and carbon footprint, um, Ryan. So, Tell us a bit about the, the Clare Castle, but also broadly, you know, wh where, where you stand on that. Yeah, look, I think never before has, you know, the planet been so important to so many people. Uh, and I think the sea change really happened last year. And from us as a business, you know, and fuels, we, we've been putting biofuels into our products well over 15, 20 years now. And, and, and that's accepted and that's moving in a certain direction. But as a business, what we've always tried to do is, is to lower our carbon footprint, both from the point of view of how we construct and build sites. And that's looking at our materials, but also in terms of making sure that we keep our operating costs low into the future. That's using such things as solar. It's looking at gray water collection. It's making sure that we're using recyclable materials in terms of the concretes, the products that we use. LED is obviously a natural one that we've been extending right across our business. And you've probably seen there in terms of Clara Castle, which is our brand refresh. All of that is using the latest technologies, the most environmentally friendly materials, and also LED. For us, I think, to be honest, and look, consumers today expect you to be responsible for the planet. Uh, and as part of our strategic plan, as part of our strategy, we've been looking at how we can move from being seen as purely a fossil fuel driven business to be one much more within the new, you know, renewable energy sector. And on that point, uh, you know, Maxwell this year in partnership with the Divine Brothers uh, will be launching our own renewable energy business, selling green electricity, carbon offset gas through brightenergy.com. Uh, it's, it's going to be cutting edge. It's going to be something that's going to certainly challenge all of the legacy energy providers right across the Irish market. That's in the Republic of Ireland and also in Northern Ireland. So it really shows that we as a business are looking now to transition where we have been, which has largely been a fuel retailer, one which is very much focused in terms of how we, we drive more profit by being a convenience led brand, but also we're now extending out our tentacles, laying down foundations in terms of the renewable energy sector, and we're going to be doing other things within our core business as well. Very good. And, and what about, uh, you mentioned uh, green prints as well uh, in, in the interview. Tell us about that. That sounds quite interesting. Well, firstly, I have to thank you, Dan, for our trip over to Shanghai to introduce me to green print. Um, you know, we've always been looking at how can we differentiate our offer. And this year we took the strategic decision to introduce our own range of premium fuels on petrol and also in diesel. And everyone makes the same claims in the marketplace in terms of better performance. It's in, in terms of energy, you know, engine cleaning uh, performance and extra kilometers. What we are doing is we are going to do carbon offsetting and every liter uh, that's sold through our premium range. And we looked at what Greenprint provide and we will be launching a major campaign with them towards the end of quarter three. So every customer who buys a litre of Maxwell Premium Fuels 
will be carbon offset. That will lead to planting over 10,000 trees within Ireland. It will also see us funding community projects to show that we really do care about the environment. It is a start, it's not the end, but it's where we really want to now start positioning ourselves to be a brand that our existing customers and new customers that we hope will come to follow us because we're, we're taking the right decisions in terms of how we reposition ourselves to do our bit for the planet. Very, very good. Well, this is a big story there, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. But last, and this has to be brief, Brian, just because we're, we're at 2.15, but next part of the session is very much future vision um, post-COVID um, post, uh, pandemic. Just very briefly, and if you can answer this very briefly, I mean, looking at the design of Clare Castle, I mean, what, you know, what, what are the things that you would, you know, what would the checklist be of things that you'd have to reconsider a little bit if you were doing it now as opposed to, to, to when, you, we, when you put the ideas together? I think if we're looking five years ahead, for me, it's how do we continue to drive footfall and traffic into our stores. One of the things we've learned in COVID-19 is about the importance of technology. It's how do we bring more traffic to our stores? Most, most definitely in terms of the internal footprint of that store, it's, it, it's unlikely to change much other than we might give certain products more space. You know, products such as food service, I think will continue to be very, very important into the future. So therefore your store needs to be really designed around that. But I think what's equally important is click and collect, having dedicated parking for that, even pickup is going to be absolutely so important. I think the other thing that we're seeing in this, in this change is, particularly in city centre locations, there may well be an opportunity for more cycle parking, which one would never have thought about before, particularly if customers are going to be cycling into your stores. But in terms of what we offer, all we're going to try to do is continue to improve what we're currently doing. And, and in terms of the size of sites will only but get bigger because you're gonna to need to be able to do more things. I think in five years time, I'd love to have pharmacies. I certainly would love to have dry cleaning within our stores. And I would like to have our own dedicated pickup point where people no longer want goods going to their homes to save on those emissions. They come to our network, they pick up their parcels, they get their evening meal, and they either cycle home or they drive home. Terrific. I, I, I think that's a good challenge to set us, Brian, you know, take a five year view. What would it look like in five years? So I think we're going to do that now with um, with Joe and Craig. Um, so, Brian, if if we can welcome you back um, uh, once we've had the presentation and perhaps you can join the panel um, and um, and tell us what you think of, uh, of what Joe and and Craig have, uh, have had to say in their presentation. So if you could mute your your okay, mic and, um, and your video and then we'll bring you back in again in a minute. Um, welcome, guys. Um, Joe, thank great. You. Thank you, Brian. Very uh, good. That was great, interesting, Brian. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. super. The start so, of the Joe, my question, uh, oh. the one you've been waiting for. Um, so, how was your flight here, Joe? My flight? Yeah, we well, see there are upsides to this. Uh, yeah. There wasn't yeah, one. Well, you know, yeah. And, my, my flight, nine, yeah, it was great. Time. It was better than the Concorde, <laughs> if you remember that. The number of times that Joe has lost his bags on, on flights um, or has his bag lost on flights, you see, this kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. No, not anymore. Um, so, you know, you have to look at the upsides. I, I know you do. Well, welcome, Craig, um, Joe. Um, you've got, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up and let you do the talking. Um, you've put together some really interesting ideas in this presentation. So I'm going to stay, I'm gonna stay um, online. Um, watching, but um, can I hand over to you guys to, to talk us through what you've put together? Great, thanks. So, you know, what, what, what I thought is maybe just to sort of start and then, you know, I'd like, love to have Craig sort of fill in, is, you know, the last time we chatted, we were, you know, maybe a few weeks into this pandemic and we were sort of looking at, all of the things that were happening um, out of necessity, you know, having to have queue lines and these, you know, Perspex shields that were protecting employees from customers and safe distancing. And th there were just so many of these things that were occurring that were, 
you know, happening at the speed of thought. You know, we, we had to respond really quickly to all of these conditions. And, and then all of a sudden, retailers started getting a little bit more savvy as, you know, dining at home became much more important than dining out. Um, all of a sudden, curbside pickup became a lot more important and drive-through became a really, really hot point. And so, you know, we started to think, you know, those were really good short-term um, solutions how much of this has stickiness and how much of this will impact the future of design for our industry. And so that's, you know, where we are today is to take a quick look at just really some thought provocative ideas that, you know, may or may not be relevant for the audience, but, you know, they're just things that help us think, you know, what, of these ideas may stick and how will it affect the stores of the future. And so, you know, we're going to take a look and have a little discussion on site orientation. What might those site components be? You know, collection options, uh, options. you know, Brian mentioned that he thinks curbside pickup will become even more important. So maybe that's one of the, the stickiness um, uh, uh, ideas that will, will, will stay around. Hygiene and safety, I mean, that's always been a big concern for our industry and we certainly don't think that's gonna go away, but you know, how do we elevate that and, and make people feel safe and, and, and comfortable? You know, cues and technology, you know, Brian again mentioned the use of technology. You know, we agree that we think technology will have a, you know, a huge role going forward. And, and um, you yeah, know, so these are some of the things that we're going to take, uh, begin to take a look at through some of the next few slides. Very interesting. So, and, and Joe, when, when you and I started talking, we, we really said, okay, let's, uh, let's start with some of the data points that we have. And try and understand, you know, what, what uh, certainly what Shopworks have been measuring over the last years, um, to try and understand what the what opportunities might exist uh, in in this kind of future format, or, or what might be happening over the next five years. And and I think what we're hearing a lot is that, you know, COVID has it's concentrated a lot of people's minds in the in the shopping environment, wider than petrol forecourt retail, and the, and the things that stick will be the ones that. Uh, make customers feel more comfortable or, or they feel will help improve their lives and you know given given the external measures that we've we've been looking at over time so you know how which pumps are people using and uh, you know Brian quite rightly said as fuel gets more efficient you need fewer pumps some of those might be replaced with EV points you know where are people parking to use one of your terms Joe um, you know, where should that be, how efficient it is, how, how many times you need to turn it, in, and given the change in, in what's going on inside. And, and also the, the change in technology that we're now able to use so that, you know, we've gone from manual counting to using cameras. We can now use CCTV, so there's no retrofitting required. And, and that starts to get exciting. And if you tee that with the technology that's coming along, you know, pump through RFID so there's no need to pay on the forecourt, you know, alongside the normal pay at pump kind of technology, it, it's getting really, really exciting. And, and what, what we talked about was the, the, the kind of the split between what's outside and what's inside. And, and also the split between attended and non-attended markets. Because in the, in the non-attended markets, you've got to walk into the shop currently, you may not may not want to because of COVID and the rest of it, but, but you have to go in there to pay. But what happens in the attended markets? You know, and there's a much bigger problem out there because people don't have to get out of their car, they pay in the car. And then, and then we kind of discuss there are three choices. You can bring the product to the car, you can bring the people to the product, or you can bring the car to the product. And, and I know you're gonna look at that in a sec, Joe. So externally and then internally, um, on the on the next uh, the next slide, you know those measurements are changing as well. How efficient and how effective is the use of space? Where are people going within the store? You know we know that people shop at sixty degrees, they turn at forty five degrees, and to sell them something, we've got to get them within one point two meters of the product. How efficient is that uh, is that space for them? And you know, the more efficient we can make it, the more products and services people can sell. And then again, the tracking used to be manual, then went to cameras, and now there's tremendous technology coming through that actually tracks every product 
rather than the people. So then you, then you suddenly into the world of, uh, of contactless pay, which again is going to revolutionize what, what shops start to, uh, to look like. And, you know, I, I've, I've been lying in my bath wondering why I just don't like those Amicus and Goat shops. Um, and, and I kind of, I think I finally came to the conclusion was that it's because they've clearly been designed by technologists as opposed to, you know, people with a bit more human and, and empathy touch. So, you know, I think we need to start to combine that whole technology, but with, with the joy of shopping, you know, as, it, as it's also been, as it always has been, so to speak. So I think, you know, now we can, we can move on to, to look at the, some of those different formats that, that we were discussing. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think that, you know, we're the social interaction of shopping is never going to go away. Uh, just uh, by definition, you know, people enjoy uh, being out and, and they and I think shopping, whether it's for food or convenience or clothing, you know, I, I just don't think that social interaction is going to go away. I know it's certainly a lot easier to do things online, but I think people, there's still a joy of being able to go into a retail environment and, and, and just experience, um, uh, you know, whatever that offer may be. Um, you know, so I, think, um, I think everybody on the, on the call probably hopes that's the case. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I believe that. Um, they sort of say what's old is new again. And, you know, uh, not to sort of date myself here, but, you know, many years ago when we were working in, in Ireland, Stat Oil had just bought the uh, BP network. <clears throat> and they had a format at the time that was this forced traffic pattern. They had the checkout counter in the middle. They had one door that was that you would have to enter and then you would have to walk around the, the checkout area and you would exit out the, 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 the second door on the other side of the uh, checkout counter. And it was sort of this forced pattern. And, um, you know, that inspired us to come up with some ideas and we developed uh, layouts similar to what you see on the uh, right hand side of the screen um, where we sort of reinterpreted it by, you know, using the Ikea model in a way where you, you know, were forced to come into one entrance. We brought everybody through the high impulse, high margin categories of food service, um, and then really wrapped them around the store, uh, past impulse merchandise into a queue, and then at the checkout, and then you entered at the bottom. <clears throat> and it really forced people to have to navigate, you know, 50% of the store. The same goes uh, on the left-hand uh, layout, which was a, a little bit of a further take on that idea. Um, and, and the one on the left, you know, had different checkout lanes. And so those could be things like Amazon Go. Um, they could just be self-checkout um, in addition to one-man checkout idea. But, you know, we thought perhaps what's old is new again in the sense that does this help us with queuing and safe distancing and how do we manage people and relieve those congestion points that you know people will be nervous about at least in the short term as we come out of the COVID uh, situation and this idea of social distancing and, and, and keeping separation and and just organized flow and so you know we don't know if this is the right answer for many in the audience but we certainly think that it's worth revisiting uh, some of these ideas and, and sort of bringing them back and and exploring whether these would help not only drive sales and really highlight the uh, the key offers that we have uh, but would it also help relieve some of that social tension that's uh, built up over the last few months around the world with, uh, you know, safety and distancing and so forth. Yeah, and, and Joe, I think, you know, it, it's a good point. And, and for me, not, not only does your kind of one-way strategy start to relieve people's uh, tension over, over COVID. And when I was in, uh, in Westfield, one of London's bigger shopping centers on, on Wednesday, and almost every store that I went into had implemented a one-way system in order to make their customers feel more comfortable. And, and what was interesting to observe was that the, the stores that had been slightly more, I don't want to say aggressive, but slightly more forceful or instructive is probably the word I'm looking for. The stores that have been slightly more instructive, the customers seemed to feel a lot more comfortable than those were a bit more, who were a bit more wishy-washy, if, if you want to use that term. So, you know, I, I think shoppers as they come back, I mean, you know, a percentage of the population have all been out to um, the supermarkets and the convenience stores out of necessity. 
you know, as we go back to social shopping, I, I think people are expecting to be guided. Um, and I, I think that may, that may last for a while. And, and if we start to look at the numbers, you know, and Brian quite rightly said, we're all in this to make money. You know, on the left hand side here, what we're showing is that 70% of the customers into this petrol forecourt uh, shop turned left straight to the counter, the fast lane that most people call it or whatever, or, or, or whatever they want. When, when we replan the format, we got people deeper into the store and got them exposed to uh, higher margin products, as you were suggesting. You know, browsing was up 37%, food category sales up 69%, shop sales up 25% and shop margin up 13 So, you know, there's always been this kind of reluctance for, for people to guide their customers. But I, I think now, you know, th there is an opportunity to do it not only for the good social distancing of the customers, but also for exposing products to the danger of being sold, as, as we might say. Um, and then in the in the next slide, um, all we did was uh, just mock up a quick kind of in, impulse format, where you know the thought behind this is it, it is you referenced IKEA, I would reference Tiger of Copenhagen, where everything's at grab level. You try and present every product three times so that nobody has to go backwards. You put in kind of little laybys where people can dwell for longer, but you drive people around the around the store as as, as uh, past the products as you can. You know, if we manage to integrate the kind of um, technology that leads to uh, 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 frictionless checkout, then that would even be another easier step for this. You wouldn't have the three tills at the end. Um, so yeah, com completely in agreement that COVID and, and the future may look at slightly more um, in this direction. Yeah, I, I think uh, you're right, and 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 I and I think people, um, you know, I don't know if they want to be corralled in a certain way, but I think you know people like IKEA and and uh, the examples you've shown, I you know I think people do respond in in, in those kinds of environments in, in, a, in a positive way, and I think that if we could adapt some of those ideas uh, into our stores, then I think you know, I, I think people will look for, customers will look for guidance from us and they're expecting us. I think in the future, they're going to expect retailers to kind of figure it out for them. Um, I don't think they want to go in a store and have to worry about uh, those kinds of things. And so if we could make the layouts a bit more efficient and functional um, and give them a sense of safety um, and security, then then I think that's on us, not, not on our customers. Absolutely right. And, you know, we, we also, um, you know, Craig, you and I have been talking over the last week or so, and we've talked about this notion that, you know, fueling in the future may become more diminished. And so having huge forecourts, you know, in front of the building may not be where the industry, go, you know, heads in the future. And, and that's not to say that fossil fuels going away and fueling positions are, are, are not going to be relevant anymore. They will, <clears throat> but maybe they don't need to be the most important thing that we have. And so if, if we sort of rethink the site and, and we know that our sites today aren't designed to have drive-throughs and pickup points and, um, and parking lots and, and, and all of those things, how do we reinterpret and rethink the, the, the site? Um, to better accommodate those things that may uh, evolve out of this pandemic. And so if we wanted to add drive-through lanes, how do we do it? If we need pickup points, um, you know, where is that located? Can we move fuel off to the side so that the store becomes its own important entity and, and perhaps there's a big car park in front so that it's a lot more convenient for people to shop the store. And then drive-through lanes, you know, you know, could we get a lot of the queue of vehicles back behind the store and then have multiple lanes, you know, maybe one for ordering on site and then being able to pick up and go. <clears throat> and then maybe the other two lanes are just purely click and collect. I've, I've, I've got my order, uh, geofencing uh, alerts the uh, retailer that I'm close by. They get my order ready. I dry, they tell me as I approach, you know, lane two, and I pull up to lane two, there's a little screen that says, you know, your order will be delivered to your, you know, the boot of your car in two minutes. And I wait and someone comes out, fills it in and I, and I, and I drive away. So the idea here is that we could virtually shop the store um, or um, order things online, uh, click and collect, uh, order, you know, at a drive-through window, all without having to get out of the car.
I love that, Joe. I, I, I just think that's, um, you know, if you see all these uh, photos and there's one there, I think that's from a EG group site, you know, of, of drive throughs queuing back out onto the road. You know, it's, it's a really interesting thought that you've come up with there. Yeah. And, you know, I, again, I don't know how much drive through um, will stick, but certainly customers have gotten very used to drive through. <clears throat> it's been one way where it provided a bit of social interaction to some degree. Um, but it's also something that I think they've become a lot more familiar with. And I'm sure people who never considered drive through may now consider it in the future. So, you know, we think there are, there is some potential uh, of drive through in a meaningful way. And one way to look at drive through is not to just have the little window on the side of a building, but to actually make it feel like it's part of the offer. And so do you have a canopy and <clears throat> is there some technology outside and, and how do you embrace the idea of drive through? and pick up points um, that's an integrated part of the building and an integrated part of the architecture so that it speaks to this idea of convenience. Um, and, and it's not just a, you know, a parking spot in front where someone runs out to your car, but it's actually done in a more thoughtful way. And so, you know, this is just a sketch of, you know, how maybe we could start incorporating some of these ideas into the actual vernacular of the, of the store and the site and how they operate. Okay. Sorry, next slide. Um, and then the, the uh, uh, back one, thank you. So the last um, sort of idea we were thinking is, you know, this idea of what happens if really you ne nobody ever wants to get out of their car again. <clears throat> and so obviously I can- oh, can I interject just, just yeah, sure. the, the stats on this are that, you know, in certain markets, 80% of people never get out of their car. So, you know, for me, for too many more, I, I think this is, uh, this is genius. So the idea here is it becomes actually a drive through store. Um, and you'll see in a minute, uh, some ideas of how you can sort of bring that idea to life. But, you know, the fueling is really secondary. It's all the way off to the left. Um, obviously, the depends on what country and you know the, the, the you know if you drive on the left or right hand side of the road. But uh, in the U.S., yeah, either, it'd be the last thing you see because it'd be on the left hand side. But you'd have this store which we call the block, and you'll see why we call it the block in a minute. But you actually sort of drive through uh, this store, and there's an order point, and and everything's exposed. So I, I see what they have. Um, there's Pete. There's runners inside the store that help. Uh, pull the offer together. I drive around, and and I could sort of leave uh, and and never have to get out of my uh, out of my car. And yet I could sort of do. Uh, I can get food. I can get coffee. I could get um, milk and and bread. Um, all of those things uh, without having to leave my my vehicle. So this is sort of a drive. This is taking drive through to the next level, and it's really just thinking about a drive through concept, <clears throat> but done in a bit more of an interesting way. <clears throat> Excuse me. You just comments on that um, because I think it's just such a great idea. I mean, I think interestingly, I mean, we did a very interesting interview with uh, Ilias at EG Group, um, you know, within the last couple of weeks. And uh, one of his points was many markets have, un have, have underestimated the importance and opportunity of drive through. I have to say EG didn't, did they? And in the UK particularly, they've done really well out of it. And the point he made in the interview um, a couple of weeks ago was that just your point really that there is a next level to this uh, so it's not perhaps enough just to think about drive-through but it's probably necessary to reinvent it on the basis that it was doing really well anyway um, and this is just going to give it wings isn't it so I, I think your 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 sort of concept here is, is really clever and, and so if you see the uh, the next slide you'll, you'll you'll see that because I do believe we're an impulse driven um, business and and our industry thrives on exposing people to as much as possible um, because it's you know we sell so much on impulse um, and so the idea here is the block is the square and it's a glass uh, glass block if you if you like um, <clears throat> but everything on the inside is stepped back from the glass so the the heart and the core of the operation is fully exposed. Um, if there's food service, there's a kitchen, you could see things being prepared. Um, you almost could smell the coffee, um, uh, although that's a bit of a, an exaggeration. But, you know, the idea here is that the store really starts to merchandise itself 
uh, from the outside. And so I could see everything. The coolers are exposed. They're highly visible. And through digital communications and technology, <clears throat> we can communicate what's inside the store. Or we can communi communi communicate specials. Um, but the idea is that you're actually going to drive underneath this um, on the right-hand side. You drive through almost a tunnel where you now sort of feel like you're in the store and the fact that it's all glass and it's exposed and that I could see goods and products inside, um, you know, sort of helps that notion of impulse and, and, the, and the fact that we're trying to really merchandise the inside of the store to the outside. <clears throat> and so this is really just some examples and some visuals of how the block can come to life. Um, and um, yeah, we think it's pretty interesting. And, and then as Craig and Brian both spoke about um, technology, <clears throat> you know, we thought that, you know, how do you embrace this notion of still, whether you could order on an app through your phone and just be able to pick up, um, having menus that um, allow you to, um, you know, customize an order when you're right there. Uh, maybe you want to add something, but the idea of notion of technology and how that works and using your phone to pay. And, and so just making that process a bit easier, how do you highlight the service component? And so maybe we don't want service to disappear, but just creating the frame around the window uh, almost celebrates the employee uh, to some degree and sort of creates a stage for them so that we don't, we don't lose sight that it's, it's still a service business and that we need a friendly face from time to time. Um, so these are some of the examples and ideas behind the block. And, you know, again, we're, we're not, you know, who knows how far technology and, and this COVID situation will take us and where it will lead us. And, and drive through, we think, could be one of those interesting ideas that will be rethought and, and, and redeveloped and, and people will start embracing it maybe in a different way than they ever considered in the future. Um, and again, it's just a way of being able to express this where it's not just a window on the side of the building. Tremendous. Well, look, um, just because time's moving on, let's, Nick, let's keep that image, the last slide up on screen, Nick, um, if that's okay. Um, and um, that's the one. And Brian, can we bring you back um, and ask you um, as a retailer, I mean, um, anything in that? Yeah, look, I think there's some really interesting insights. So the first thing is hygiene will never be as important going forward. It's absolutely crucial that stores are set up correctly. And I think it's quite interesting in terms of the directional approach in terms of trying to get people to shop the shop because people are creatures of habit. They'll go to the shortest point, you know, to the pay. But I'm very much off the view, and this is something that we have learned, people have different shopping missions. I can recall having a debate, don't put pay at pump on the forecourt because it's going to reduce the amount of impulse sales of people coming in store. What we have found when we did the trials is that people who want to buy fuel want to get in and out quickly. So pay at pump, contactless payment at pump will support your growth in fuel sales. If you've got the right in-store offer, you will drive more traffic, more fitful in-store if you've got the right, right approach. And I think the interesting point there, and I totally agree with Joe and Craig, is that drive-through will play a, a growing role in terms of how we serve more customers. But I think it goes hand in hand with technology. That technology needs to be linking the online with the offline. So you're driving the people more to your sites by using that technology and the physical bricks and mortar are really there to service the needs of new customers. Because really we're in business here, not just to continue serving and retaining our existing customers, it's how do we expand our reach? How do we expand to, to bring more customers in that never have, have shopped with us before? And I think that's one of the things that COVID-19 has done. It's, it's brought people local to stay local. They now understand what good convenience forecourts can deliver. And I think we've got a real opportunity in which to build upon that. Uh, and that's probably about the only positive that really came out of COVID-19, to be quite honest. So mm -hmm. I think it's a fantastic presentation and some great insights. So thank you, Joe and Craig. And thanks, Joe and Craig. And great, yeah, we can go full screen again now. Um, we've had quite a few questions. So let me just put a few questions to you guys, all three of you. Um, the first one really was, was around um, EV charging. I mean, uh, Kirby uh, Mindel asks, um, how far would you consider, how far out would you consider some of these concepts are? So I guess this one's for Joe and, Joe and Craig. She, uh, he, uh, Kirby said, I'm not seeing reference to EV charging. 
which often presumes some dwell time on site. I think you did have EV charging at the front of the store on that layout, didn't you? Um, any, any, any response on that? Perhaps Joe first? Yeah, we, we did. <clears throat> and I probably should have uh, called that out, but we did have EV charging on the uh, site plan. Um, <clears throat> the site plan where we had the block. And so uh, the, the car park that was in, uh, in front of the store um, actually had um, EV charging. So, you know, we do think that, you know, EV charging will be something that has to be considered. Um, <clears throat> it's just another fueling option. And, and so I think that over time, um, you know, it, it obviously in the drive-through in the block, uh, there is, um, you know, there, there is no dwell time inside the store because it's all about throughput and, and speed and efficiency, but it doesn't mean that we may not also have EV charging. It's just that you wouldn't be able to, uh, you'd have to have a separate place to, uh, to charge, but you know, where you don't have a drive through and uh, like the block where you're driving through the store, um, you know, certainly that uh, we think EV charging, <clears throat> you know, something that uh, should be considered for sure. Very, very good. Now question from Shane Cantillon. Uh, maybe this one's for you, Brian. Um, the question is, what is the panel's view on scan pay go uh, without the need to go to checkout? So I guess this is, and we were having a conversation earlier about, you know, looking at, I think your contactless rate has increased by five, factor of five or so, hasn't it, in terms of number of customers using contactless. And, and do you have any view on, on scan pay go, Brian? Yeah, I, yeah, like a couple of points there. I think never has there been such a sea change in terms of people moving from chip and pin to contactless for obvious reasons. And, in terms of, of, of just the fear in terms of, of, of catching COVID-19. But in terms of what we need to do as a business, we need to make as much of this as we can, um, rather than contactless, because I think we're already contactless there now. So it's looking into the future, anything that we can do to give the customer complete control of the entire experience, they can come in and they can pick up their goods, they can scan and they can go. You know, we as a business are looking at trialing some, some self-checkouts, uh, particularly in our busier convenience-led stores, because it's all about giving control back to the customer. And I think some of the lessons that we've seen through, through COVID-19, people don't like other people touching their products. They want as less contact as they can have. And, and certainly even in terms of, of, of some of our open counters, all of those products are now packaged. None of them are sitting open and exposed. So I think, yes, I, I do think there will be a trend towards that. Very, very good. Um, I've got to get this quote in. This is, this is not me, this is Klaus, uh, Klaus Mantel, who's a good friend of, of, of ours, uh, now at McKinsey. Um, and Klaus said that for the consumer, you know, uh, dirty has become lethal in their mind. So anything that they saw previously as dirty, they now see as potentially lethal. And I thought that was a great way of summing up the the transitions in the consumer's minds and how important it is it is it is to us that's a bit of an aside but craig question for you from david donnelly due to social distancing a potential issue has arisen with queues and speed of service self-service grab and go hot and cold food is one part of the solution another may be turning the deli into a production kitchen and developing new food offer uh, including home meal re home meal replacements etc any, any, any views on that? And I know you do a lot of work in terms of, obviously, which you've already talked about in the presentation around flows uh, and making sure that the store is, you know, is used efficiently. Um, any views on that? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, you know, it's anything that's taking too much time is, is causing problems for, for people both in, you know, for people behind those who are queuing. Um, you know, if you go to the supermarket, because the, the aisles are really wide, you by definition, have a have a overtaking zone. I think I would des describe it as through the centre. You can kind of chicane down the aisles, avoiding people uh, sufficiently. Now, petrol stations, where the, where the, the aisle width is typically between a metre and one point two metres, you know, there's no overtaking. So if you're dwelling too long at the at the coffee machine to prepare your own coffee, or at the deli counter ordering something bespoke, you know, you are stopping everybody else processing through the, through the, through the process. And, and the quicker for the, for the time being, and, and I think a little bit into the future, the quicker that we can, can create that turnover and get processed people, it, it means that there aren't queues running outside. It means that people have confidence that they can get in and out quickly 
And in the end, you go to the convenience store because it's convenient. And your, your belief is that you'll get in and out. So yes, I, I think those kind of things that uh, he, he's proposing are in, entirely sensible. Thanks for that question. Look, we never normally overrun, but there's no way I could cut you guys off. It was just too good. Um, so, but we will, we will bring it to, to an end now. And just one last point from, which is a point rather than a question from Rob himself to all panelists. Thank you to all the panelists for a really interesting conversation on the future of forecourt design, Rob himself, uh, South Africa. So thank you for that comment, Robin. And um, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Craig, um, for, um, for appearing and um, giving us such great, uh, great insights into what's going on in, uh, in your businesses and what we can perhaps look forward into the future. So um, nice to catch up with you guys as ever. Yes, thank you and uh, everybody stay safe. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so um, just, to, just to finish up um, before we close, um, thank you to, to the panel um today um as as ever and um just perhaps uh, a quick look forward to something which is coming out on global sea store focus soon uh we we've done quite a lot of um sessions on mobility in the future of electric vehicles um so look out next week on global sea store focus for a really good roundup article looking at some of the conclusions um that we've perhaps reached on this two shop talk sessions uh, which looked at this topic, and that was with some really great panelists, you know, from um, Aaron at, at, uh, at Nissan GB to Eric at, at McKinsey, John at the Fuels Institute, Sophia at BP, and Eric from our good friends at the EV Association in Norway, who are fantastic, I think, and, and of course, James, um, who has perhaps a bigger follower, followership, if that's the right word, on LinkedIn than most other um, human beings, um, and with good reason. Um, so, so there's um, there's some huge insights I think in that article coming up next week on uh, on mobility and uh, electric vehicles, a subject we're going to come back to again in the future. So, thank you very much for spending uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes with us, and um, tune in again soon. Good afternoon. <laughs>